who are you? How would you? Okay, I'm. My name is Peter Cook. I'm an architect, and I have been for many years also in what the Americans call an educator. I'm 81 years old, and I'm still working fairly full on. So, what makes a good architecture? A good architect. The ability to do more than necessary meaning to actually make more out of the program than it's immediately obvious. That might be in formal terms, it might be in operational terms. It can take other forms which interest me less. It can be, to, you know, that, wow, we did this on half a million pounds and everybody else would cost three million kind of argument. Or, hell, we pushed fiberglass as far as you could push fiberglass or we could grow it from you know we can grow it which now people at the plant are doing growing stuff and so are you a good architect no i sir. think so i'm a brilliant architect <laughs> i think I'm, i mean i would like to hope that i'm an interesting architect i mean a lot of meaning that a lot of people wouldn't like what i do but they wouldn't be bored by it is there anything you envy the young architects of today? I envy their ability with a computer. I don't envy them in a cultural situation very much. I think that they're much more, they're very careful. Maybe not in Austria, but certainly here. They're, they're very careful. Do you think the times when like you started architecture was mm. a much more liberate yeah, much more liberal. Everybody's so worried now, you know, they're so worried. They don't want to be seen to be doing the wrong thing. Whereas I think we used to enjoy doing the wrong thing. That that made it made it interesting. Yeah. Fuck you, let's see what happens if we do this. Now they're saying, Well, I don't think we should do that. No, 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 no. And you end up with that that polite modernist stuff. Do you think something like Archigram could have also happened today? What was the reason it started? I think it probably can happen in other fields. But not in architecture at the moment or the times? Well, maybe in a funny place somewhere, you know? Do you think sort I, of like the urge of, of a utopia was bigger back then in Europe? Than I've never thought what, what we did was utopian, you see. I, I always thought it was very much in the in the train about I didn't think it was the utopia. It didn't demand a, a different world. It's just a different interpretation of what you do with it. Do you believe Archigram? I think I think Archigram stuff was very middle of the road kind of uh, liberal right wing socialist, not very extreme. It didn't demand a, a, a change of government or anything. It's where f Do you believe things? architecture can be humorous? Oh yes, but not. I think I think you can fall into a trap if you just said this is a nice, silly, jolly idea, without trying to make it work as well. You know, I think you can make it work and be in, and and have a few jokes up its sleeve. So, what would the architect Peter Cook say to the student Peter Cook from there? Look, look at what people do, and then try and make the most of it. Many years ago, I had a student, and she always in the memory because she was very beautiful and very talented. She was doing a bus station. I was looking at her plans of it, and I said, Amanda, do you, do you use the bus? She said, sure, I come in every day on a bus. I said, which way did you get? Imagine yourself getting out of the bus. Which way did you get out of the bus? She looked at me, and I said, well, I said, right, why is it then you put the platforms on the other side? Because she was reading it out of a planning book. I said, you're doing a bus station, just go through all the motions of using the bus and the bus driver and you'll have the scheme. And that was a long time ago and she ended up working for the Smithsons. She was actually herself a good designer. Probably didn't make that mistake twice but a lot of people they don't they take things from formulae and they press the button on the computer and it does that they don't and and i know that because now a lot of 
students don't see things in terms of the actual size. They can make a three-dimensional space and it can be amazing. You know, this thing was actually originally knocked out on a computer. Then the question is, how big is the person in it? You know, it could, <laughs> that could be a sort of bath and the bloke could have his head poking out the top. Or it could be some amazing, you know, thing where the person is a centimetre high. But often they do something and I say, how far is it from there to there? And then they measure it after they've made the project. I can't do that. I'm, I wish I could do that with a computer. I can't. Everybody in the building can use a computer except for me, except for lectures. And so I spend a lot of time with the scale, you know, saying, oh, well, yeah, oh, you might bump your head there. That's nice. That gives you a bit of room to do this. Oh, that's nice. That's even better. It gives you the thinking of what people do, what they see, you know. Is a sort of three metre balcony very different from a two metre balcony? Yes. A four metre balcony is even better if you can get it. You can put a table out there. So, why? What, what made you interested in architecture? Uh, I, uh, one or two things. I think uh, my mother had a poor background and therefore never could go to art school, but she always wanted to go to art school. So, she was artistic, as they say in a broad term. My father was an army officer and we moved a lot. And he was at one point in charge of taking buildings for the army. And I used to go around with him as a little tiny kid seeing these buildings and so on. That's it. It, adapting yourself to different towns. I, we lived in a lot of different English provincial towns, which makes me interested in urbanism because as a kid I had to get to know what that town was doing. If I wanted the aeroplane model shop or the ice cream shop or to get a bus, I had to damn well find out how the town worked. Otherwise, I was like a, I couldn't operate. And so I think one develops an antennae, which is for spotting things. I'd say, ah, I bet there's an ice cream shop down there, or the buses all seem to be going here, or the castle's always on the hill there in the other town, so maybe the castle's on the other hill in this town. And it sort of is. You know, if you're, again, European towns, I think, are much more interesting than American town which tend to have a grid and that's it you know and a bit of a downtown with some high rises european towns had these interesting things like i said we said we also learned helsinki where there will tend to be a theater there will tend to be a castle there will tend to be a river crossing there will tend to be a rich area on the west side of town because in northern europe the wind blows in that direction therefore you find that so many cities have this same structure. The rich people on the hill in the west, the poor people traditionally on the lower ground towards the east, and now all the hip characters are living on the east side, and you can count off the cities, one after the other, London, Oslo, da 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 da, da all where people like you guys are living on the east side, because that's where the, the old factories vacated. Uh, and I find this is sort of interesting. Uh, it's not predictableness. It's t taking a lot of different criteria into account. But one funny thing I know about myself is that when I was a kid doing history, and I was considered quite good at history for some reason, I could always write essays that seemed to get good marks, but I was not interested in history before the railway. If, you, if I go into medieval history, medieval, medieval. Biblical history, stuff about Henry VIII, sort of you know it, but I wasn't interested. As soon as you get people with railways and, and viaducts and canals and buildings that you can see, I, I love inventing histories of things. You know, I love the sort of gossip where you say, well, so-and-so was there and so-and-so was there, and then you guess what they were doing, you know, you invent the fact somebody's having an affair with somebody or that somebody was somebody's, you know, putting money into something. You don't really know the facts, but you sniff that the money was moving or the girl was that girl or the, 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 the guy was the, 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 the Machiavellian figure is such and such. You don't, and, and you Austrians, I mean, you're the kings of this. You, the Austrians have more... <laughs> 
more vicious gossip than any other people I've ever come across. You know, you love it. You, 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 the way the Austrians will knife their best friend is second to none. You know? I'm fascinated by that kind of thing because then when you're designing, I mean, very often, um, I like inventing, even giving names to people who actually inhabit the project. And once or twice I've now done cartoons. I draw cartoons of people inhabiting the project. And I did this particularly when we did the Australian building, which was a competition. And my colleagues who persuaded me to draw, draw about 20 or more cartoons, which we put in with the formal drawings for the competition, and we won the competition. 